So today we are going to talk about uh, organogenesis and in this context we are going to learn about the wing and the leg development and if time permits uh, we can also go through the eye development today. So these tissue, these uh, adult organs, wing, uh, halt here, eyes, etc. They are precursor cells in uh, fruit fly. They become visible at the stage of uh, larval development. And these uh, tissues, they are called imaginal discs. And these imaginal discs uh, are shown here, for example, uh, these are the eye antenna imaginal disc. Then these are the uh, leg imaginal disc, wing uh, imaginal disc, and then halt here, uh, the genitalia. So <clears throat> these are basically pouches of cells, uh, simple pouches of epithelium, in which cell fates are determined. Uh, the cell fates are determined that they are going to uh, become adult organs. They are going to differentiate into adult organs. Okay, so there are very clear gene expression programs. You can say uh, wing-specific gene expression program or Altair-specific gene expression program. They are actually established in response to specific cell signaling events. So, as you can see, <clears throat> since these are uh, <clears throat> epithelial cells, <clears throat> pouches of epithelium, apparently they all look same. Morphologically, they appear same, uh, but they develop according to the segments in which particular parasegment or segment they are going to, uh, uh, they have their position. And according to the position of their segment, that's how they are going to develop. We are going to correlate the, these segmental or compartmental boundaries in later part of our lecture. The specification uh, and the basic pattern, pattern of these uh, imaginal discs, that actually occurs within the embryonic epithelium. So you may remember we talked about, you know, the uh, earliest signs of segmentations, uh, the, the minor grooves, and all that uh, developmental pattern which emerges during the uh, embryonic development. It is at that particular stage when uh, the specification and basic patterning of these imaginal discs take place. It's only at the larval stage they start becoming visible because they, they start becoming big. So at the embryo, <clears throat> embryonic stage, they are initially 20 to 40 cells when this specification and basic patterning is occurring. But uh, they grow thousandfold during the larval development. And that's how when you dissect larval imaginal disc, if you recall the one week you spent with me in the lab, before this uh, lockdown again. Um, if you have isolated these imaginal discs, this is actually the growth uh, which has taken place in the larval stage. And surprisingly, what we have learned in the last 30 years is that the wing and the leg pattern is quite similar to vertebrate limb development. Um, although these structures uh, the fly leg and the fly wing, they, they, they are very different than the vertebrate structures, but the patterning is quite similar to the uh, patterning in vertebrate development. <clears throat> so let's look at when we say that this, they develop at the, uh, develop according to the segment in which they arise, so here it is uh, clear that the wing disc, it actually arises uh, at the second thoracic segment, uh, which is 
here. So this is para segment four, para segment five. So this gray line, bold line is uh, differentiation, differentiating between para segment four and para segment five. And we know uh, the relationship between para segment and adult segments. So wing uh, is on the second thoracic segment, which is shown here, and halter on the third thoracic segment. And if we uh, think about the boundaries uh, of para segments, so according to this, the wing disc is actually developing developing at the boundary uh, of para segment four five, or, and halter at five six. So it means. The early on developmental pattern, the early on patterning which took place, uh, you remember we said that uh, in the posterior, uh, we have the expression of engrailed, which was anterior of para segment. <clears throat> and as a result of expression of engrailed, we learned that there is a compartmental boundary. So these compartmental boundaries which are established at this patterning phase at early embryonic development, it remains fully preserved during later part of development, even in the uh, adult structure, adult structures here uh, or in the imaginal disc. We are going to learn this and this is something amazing. So let's closely look at the wing development. Uh, as I said, this is just uh, pouches of epithelium. <clears throat> so epithelial sheets, uh, so this is, you know, two layers of cells, which gives rise to epidermis in adults. <clears throat> now, this imaginal disc is divided into anterior, and posterior compartment, dorsal and ventral compartment. The anterior posterior compartment, its pattern is quite clear. These cells, they become uh, compartmentalized at the early embryonic development. But the dorsal ventral compartment, it becomes visible uh, when you see uh, the second instar larva. Okay, it develops properly at second instar larva. If this is the complete wing imaginal disc, wing actually emerges from these this particular region of the pouch. So we call this wing pouch. So this, all the cells here, and it's color coded. So this dark one is going to uh, make the dorsal side and this lighter one will make the ventral side, which is the uh, lower side of the wing. Then this region, the notum, it makes part of the thorax. And that's here, you can see. There's a third coordinate, which is the proximal distal in the wing as well. But we'll mostly look at uh, anterior posterior compartment and dorsal ventral uh, compartments. <clears throat> so, as I said, the wing, they develop uh, from this particular region, cells which are in the center. Here, they are all very close to each other. Dorsal and the ventral uh, compartments, they are next to each other. They are very close to each other. And then from this central line, it, it starts, it, the wing pouch is being pulled up. It's just like two layers of cells, uh, like uh, uh, two closely uh, associated layers of cells, they are pulled outside right from here in the center, okay? 
So the three compartments I told you, uh, the coordinates, anterior, posterior, dorsal, ventral, and proximal, uh, uh, proximal distal. Let's look at the anterior and the posterior compartment first. But before we go there, so this is what I was trying to explain you. So you have the dorsal region, the ventral region, when the, uh, differentia uh, the differentiation into adult wing starts. So this, now this is the uh, lateral view of the wing disc. This is how the two layers of cells, they are organized and this color code is actually this one. And cells are being pulled, they get protruded, protruded outside. And eventually, if this is the initial wing uh, being emerged, the dorsal side, and this is the ventral side of the wing. At, at the posterior and... Pardon? Uh, this thing happens at the posterior and right no so anterior posterior is here anterior and posterior this is happening along this axis okay okay if we look laterally from a side so this is the let's say this is a wing pouch the center this is this picture okay this one yeah. now if i turn this like this this top side, this one, will be visible to us that this is not a flat layer. There are, you know, such uh, bumps. And then we will see here the all this region, the wing pouch. And from here, this gets pulled out along dorsal ventral axis, which is this one and dorsal okay. remains towards head and ventral away from the head. In this one, we will have anterior posterior. We'll have to turn this one, this for during, of uh, what has happened during my metamorphosis. If we pull this, now this, the top side is the, let's say uh, like this, this side is the dorsal side now, now of the wing. And this will have its anterior posterior intact. Clear? Yes, sir. Thank you. Now, how these uh, three coordinate system in wing is established and then maintained? Uh, let's first look at uh, anterior, posterior, and then we will, during uh, this time, and we'll be learning about anterior, posterior patterning, we'll also get into uh, the dorsal ventral pattern as well. So if you pay attention here, our old friend, engrailed, you remember, we learned that the engrailed is expressed in all the anterior uh, regions of parasegments, which contribute to posterior of adult segment. So if you look at now posterior compartment in the adult, we see expression of engrailed uh, and this engrailed is missing altogether in the anterior region. And we know that the expression of engrailed contributes to compartmental boundary, but how? Engrailed leads to activation of the hedgehog in all the uh, posterior compartment and since we know that the hedgehog is a morphogen, it's a paracrine factor, it diffuses and right here at the anterior and posterior compartmental boundary, this dash line, right there, it activates DPP, our old friend, DPP, decapentaplegic. Okay. Now, we know DPP, <clears throat> is a paracrine factor as well. It's a morphogen. <clears throat> it diffuses <clears throat> and <clears throat> this while there, there is uh, the anterior posterior compartmental boundary is characterized by very high, very high expression of DPP. 
and then DPP, of course, it diffuses on both sides. Now, this primordia formation uh, is repressed in the first thoracic and all abdominal segments by the genes. You remember these genes? What, what are these genes? They're homeotic genes. These are homeotic genes. So why, one should wonder why these primordial cells, which are going to contribute to wing imaginal disc or halter imaginal disc, why they don't develop in, let's say, threat T1? Or why uh, wing imaginal disc does not develop in T3 or any of the abdominal segments. The reason is, <clears throat> if you have, how many of you attended Professor Denny DeBool's talk? Hmm? Denny DeBool ki talk kis kis ne attend ki thi? The one, good. So ones who attended that talk, they remember he talked in great detail about the reason of precise expression of homeotic genes. And in his case, he uh, told a story of Hox uh, 13, Hox B13, I, I remember. And similar is the story here, the ABDA, UBX, sex produce. so this is the uh, Antenopedia gene, this is the uh, biothorax complex genes. They are the ones we, who repress the formation. So sex comb produce, which is the Antenopedia, of course, represses development of wing primordia in uh, first thoracic, thoracic segment and the others, <coughs> UBX, ABDA in the <coughs> T3 and other abdominal segments. <clears throat> now, if you pay attention here, another of our old friend, we talk in great detail about wing glass, is actually not expressing here in the AP coordinate, but it's in the dorsal ventral axis. Okay. And again, you can see these arrows uh, telling us that it's diffusing along uh, dorsal ventral boundary. Now, let's look at the anterior posterior compartment and then while doing that, we will come to dorsal ventral as well. <clears throat> we learned that in Grail, Hedgehog and DPP, they uh, are the organizing factors uh, for, you know, sequentially developing the anterior posterior coordinate system. Uh, <clears throat> now, how it happened, we learned that there is lineage restriction, uh, which engrailed produces and expression of engrailed, it produces a smooth AP compartmental boundary by activating hedgehog, which in turn activates DPP, DPP diffuses on both sides. Uh, we know DPP is the uh, homolog of TGF beta and high expression of DPP here is actually right at the compartmental boundary. And it is assumed that probably DPP is the positional information uh, for um, you know, patterning uh, of uh, anterior and the posterior compartments. What, how DBP expression looks like? This is how normally in wing disc, if you stain uh, for DBP expression pattern, this is how, uh, you know, DBP looks like, very high expression along. So on this side, you have posterior, this is the anterior. But how DPP achieves all this uh, in the wing? Uh, and we know that this is the 
weighing out. So high DPP actually leads to expression of fault uh, and localized expression of uh, OMB. If we draw the gradient of DPP or the high expression of a, uh, DPP like here. So this is this region where you have the highest DPP, but in response to DPP, there is a gene which is called SPALT, which is highly expressed in, in, in this region. And then uh, there's another gene called OMB. OMB is uh, homologue of TBX2 and TBX3, which are involved in limb development. I told you organization or pattern of uh, fly wing is similar to the uh, vertebrate limbs. And the, this is due to the molecular tools or the molecules which are involved. So if we look at the immunostaining, so this is actually the high expression due to uh, high concentration of DPP. This is the spalt, which is this gene. Then uh, <clears throat> low concentrations of DPP lead to activation of uh, another gene, which is OMB. And OMB, I told you, is the homologue of TBX2 and TBX3 in mammalian limb development. Uh, and then one of the gene which is present in all the cells which contribute to formation of uh, wings uh, is called vestigial. And you can see uh, this red one is all the vestigial expression. Okay. Now, you can say if let's say this is the posterior and this is the anterior compartment, how we have vestigial here as well as vestigial there, you know. Of course, we learned that, you know, we have very high concentration of DPP uh, and DPP is actually diffusing. So high concentration of DPP DPP is going to induce high concentration of SPALT and then, you know, a certain threshold gradient for OMB expression. Uh, and then you have the vestigial. But question is, in each cell here, vestigial is present. Each cell contains vestigial locus. So then how vestigial is regulated? This is a beautiful dissection of the enhancers they did they discovered that they are different. If we draw vestigial gene, we have different enhancers uh, of the vestigial, one which will be responsible for expression here, the other here. So because it is not only the anterior posterior compartment, we have the dorsal ventral as well. That's what makes it all very beautiful uh, question to dissect. Now, we learned that the DPP is a long range signal, you know, uh, soon we are going to see, uh, because it's not just the development of wing uh, structure, like, you know, what we just see wing as like this, but there is pattern within the wing as well, which we call the, the veins, which are shown here. So you have, you know, the, wing margin like this one we have uh, the this side is the anterior compartment this blue side is the posterior compartment where you have high engrailed expression yellow is high dpp now these veins which emerge you know, they are also due to an interplay of hedgehog and DPP. One of the uh, key targets of DPP is thick vein. We are soon going to see in next slides uh, what is the role of thick vein and, you know, all this patterning of the wing. But let's just look at some critical questions. Let's design a question and I ask you the uh, answers. So let's say you have, this is the wing. 
and you have anterior compartment posterior so white is the anterior blue is the posterior what happens if you have clones of cells which are not able to respond to dbp we just learned that dbp diffuses on both sides but what will happen if we make clones where cells they don't respond to dpp and second question will be what will happen if we have ectopic expression of dpp think about what we have learned so far okay relationship of dpp with different uh, anterior posterior coordinate system uh, the, the morphogens we talked about and then think about if i make clones which are not responding to dpp what will happen to the wing morphology or if i express ectopically dpp what will happen Sir, I think the uh, anterior posterior boundary will be disturbed mm -hmm. because we said that it is positional. It it gives the positional information for this boundary. So if we have cells that don't respond, then वहाँ पे boundary नहीं बनेगी. We won't have a visible clear boundary. How we will observe this experimentally? What we will do to uh, see the result of? clones which don't respond to dpp yeah, i think we can use the flp frd system for this so that is the technique what will be our read out ji fariha sir uh, we can do the immunostaining for the proteins uh, for these pals the, the two proteins that you said the genes they will express in response to uh, in response to this um, dpp the spals and the other one spalt so and omb yeah spalt yeah so uh, if if uh, you will not have the dpp or the cells which are not able to respond to that the, the dpp they will not have these genes expressed and if, then they will not have the proteins as well good something else we can use and um, sir the vestigial can also be used because the okay. vestigial is inactive um, yeah. yeah in response to dpp good and i think we studied that there's also some phenotype that's seen when vestigial is not active like the vestigial wings good very good so that's how i'm very happy you all are now that's the whole purpose of teaching you this course so you all are now going you have gone one level above now you are not just thinking about you know uh, creating dpp clones and then sitting idle so you are thinking about how i'm going to observe those cells how in let's say wing imaginal disk i'm going to see where actually these cells are because flip frt is random you know it can be in the anterior compartment it can be posterior compartment okay so tell me what will happen if you express dpp for example here or dpp here and what will be you observe sir i think um these thick veins uh, their pattern will also be affected because of the expression pattern will pattern. be affected but let's say again if we have to look at molecular markers what will change so this is our control this is our control experiment wild this is wild type and if i express let's say dpp high dpp here what should happen um the expression of the 
of the genes that um, we discussed earlier, they will be affected and the uh, the two genes that I mentioned earlier and you discussed. So I think they'll, they'll be higher in this part because DPP is affecting its expression, the expression. But what do you think? What is maintaining this compartmental boundary? What will be effect on this compartmental boundary if we have high dpp here so the high dpp from the clone cells which are like which are topically being expressed that adpp will diffuse from that as well and mm -hmm. i think it will go towards the the this boundary the anti interior posterior compartmental boundary it, and it's it a will... morphogen it will diffuse on both sides this side and exactly. this side and yes and um, then I think it will affect this compartmental boundary as well between. Uh, between yeah, but how, what we will do to molecularly see that new boundary is being established. Which targets we can use to immunostain, for example. I think the ones like the, the genes that are down, like acting downstream of this DPP. Like uh, and I think we can do in situ as well. But I, I'm not sure about what that. What do you think about these two? You think they will remain unchanged if you have high DPP here? Uh, what I understood is that DPP is uh, acting like, you know, uh, engrailed and hedgehog is affecting DPP, so. Mm -hmm. And DPP in turn does not affect hedgehog? I think I missed that part. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. This one. Yeah, so. It's a coordinated action. It's okay, so I think it- Coordinated yeah, sorry. action. So I think it will affect the expression of the two as well. Yeah. Hedgehog so, and the engrailed. If we have cells which do not respond to DPP, we will not see Schwart and OMD expression, right? Okay. If we have ectopic DPP, yes, we will have localized OMB, Schwart, but how can we do this? We will do this by developing Hedgehog clones. Why hedgehog clones? Because DPP responds to expression of hedgehog effect. DPP, ectopic ex expression, DPP ka kesa hoga? How will you ectopically activate DPP? It's a, it's a um, signaling molecule. If you ectopically express hedgehog, you will see high DPP activity. And then of course the target genes. And what will happen if we have ectopic hedgehog clones in the anterior, which is here, this is the anterior, okay? And ectopic hedgehog clones in the posterior. If we have hedgehog here and new hedgehog here, this one we, already talked about. What will happen if we have ectopic hedgehog expression in the posterior region? I think the compartmental boundary will be shifted as well because it, the hedgehog will diffuse and activate, you know, the wingless and it, that's how it goes. It's going to regulate the expression of engrailed in turn, like the feedback. So that's how it's going to happen. That's what I understand. So nothing will happen here because this is a, <clears throat> this is a very tight control, posterior compartment. And so if you have hedgehog, hedgehog is actually already there. Look, hedgehog is already there throughout. Even if you bring in hedgehog in response to 
in grail already hedgehog is all over the posterior compartment if you ectop, uh, if you bring in hedgehog nothing will happen no effect but if you have ectopic hedgehog you will have new source of dpp and the phenotype will look like this So, <clears throat> sorry, um, sir, if you have an ectopic expression of hedgehog on the interior side, mm -hmm. then will it affect because that's some that's a place where you don't have hedgehog, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then it will have an effect. This will activate high DPP there. Yes. Then OMB, spar vestigial, and you will have a mirror image of the whole wing. So very mm -hmm. severe phenotype. Look, one, one, compartment two, two, three, three, and then two, etc. So the whole of the anterior compartment, which is this thing, it becomes duplicated. So mirror image emerges. Clear so far? Now, Let's look at the dorsal ventral coordinate system. And dorsal ventral coordinate system responds to another selector gene, which is called aptrus, A-P-T. Aptrus, okay. Um, so <clears throat> the uh, dorsal and the ventral uh, compartmental boundary is actually visualized by very specific expression of wing glass here, okay? How this wing glass in, I think two to three cells may be hardly wide uh, strip is maintained, uh, established and maintained. So what it does, uh, what Aptrus does, uh, Aptrus restricts serrate uh, in the dorsal region. So if you remember uh, the notch signaling, so there are ligands for notch. So serrate is one of the ligand and delta is the other ligand. So on the dorsal side, uh, so Aptrus restricts uh, serrate to activate notch. And then on the ventral side, uh, the second ligand of the notch, which is delta, is restricted. And that provides the dorsal control. So all this region will have aptrus expression. And this aptrus expression is helping uh, lineage restriction across dorsal and the ventral boundary. So now it means across dorsal and ventral uh, boundary, we have very well restricted expression of notch, which then uh, activates a wingless uh, signaling protein. And that's why you see very specific, this yellow one, is the uh, wingless. Wingless in turn, because it's a cell signaling molecule and you know there are uh, hundreds of genes which activate uh, downstream of wingless pathway. So wingless induces delta and serrate uh, then at the dorsal ventral uh, boundary. Now since these are the, these delta and serrate, these are uh, signaling molecules, they can diffuse, they can freely go from one to the other side. And this is what I love most in the wing imaginary list. They're signaling centers. Cell signaling centers, they are coming together to establish a pattern. And this restriction of delta towards ventral side and set it ligand of notch on the dorsal side is something amazing because you know just two three cells where wingless is going to be expressed it's activating uh, delta and serrate 
but it's the address then which restricts, you know, set it to the dorsal side and delta to the ventral side. And if we disturb this, the dorsal ventral coordinate system is disturbed. So, yeah, this is what I just said. There is signal integrate and, and, and all this, when we have, you know, DPP signaling, we have uh, hedgehog, uh, anterior, posterior, then we have, you know, uh, notch, wingless. Uh, they all are playing in this playing field to maintain the compartmental boundaries. And all the signal of the, these uh, signals during the uh, wing development, that plays a role in expression of wing. And we say, you know, the uh, vestigial actually uh, integrates all these signals uh, in a very character characteristic gene expression pattern of uh, vestigial. How vestigial is actually, you know, responding to <clears throat> different signaling centers. What we have learned is that there are two cis regulatory regions. In, I told you in the beginning, but then I stopped. I didn't want to confuse you early on. So if we draw a wingless gene, there are enhancer elements which are responsible for such expression of wingless. So because this is dorsal ventral boundary, this is anterior posterior. Now what has happened, you have now four quarters of, you know, uh, wing pouch made in the imaginal disc and vestigial is expressed in each, but we just learned that, you know, there are different signaling centers. Each cell contains vestigial, which means vestigial being expressed in this quadrant is different than this. So each quadrant has a very specific signal to activate uh, vestigial. For example, we just look at here, and this is the dorsal side and all this blue uh, is the aptress, okay? And you can see in all the dorsal side, we have the serrate, which is the ligand for notch is present. It is restricted in the dorsal side. Then this, uh, these black dots are the expression of wingless and you can see along dorsal ventral, very, very, uh, clear boundary of wingless. And then uh, these ones are basically the, these vertical blue lines are the vestigial uh, enhancer. Now, if we draw a vestigial gene here, uh, this is exon one, uh, then you have the uh, two, three, uh, no, what I'm doing, uh, so you have exons of uh, vestigial and here you have these cis acting elements. So this is one enhancer, this is another enhancer and these are lying within the introns, okay? Enhancer one, enhancer two, enhancer three and enhancer four. Each of the enhancer for example, this uh, enhancer two, this gets a signal from aptress, uh, fringe, serrat, notch, suppressor of Haiti, which is a transcription factor. It comes bind here, it binds here, and then it activates vestigial, and vestigial is activated in a certain compartment. This enhancer, which is between this exon and exon four and exon five, the, this enhancer, the quadrant enhancer, it gets active, activated in response to engrailed hedgehog DPP, 
DPP activates thequin, MADS, transcription factor binds here to this enhancer and activates a vestigial and then you have expression of vestigial. So you can see now four clear uh, in each quadrant you have uh, vestigial being expressed. Is it clear so far? What is time now? It's 10.53. Okay. So let's stop here. No, let's cover this and then we cover the leg development. So how the waning pattern takes place in uh, wing. So there's, as we learned, there's a gradient of uh, hedgehog and DPP that specify uh, the anterior posterior compartment. Here, if we just, you know, imagine this is the wing pouch and these are the veins, you know, vein three, vein four, etc. These are the uh, pro-veins in the wing imaginal disc. This region is the intervein region. No vein is de uh, developed here. Okay. So, <clears throat> What we learn that, you know, there are, uh, there's an interplay of hedgehog and DPP. They try to, you know, overcome each other. So DPP is uh, trying to inhibit hedgehog. On the other hand, hedgehog in the, in the intervein region tries to activate EGFR signaling, okay? Uh, but since DPP blocks hedgehog in the intervein region, so there is uh, the target gene of DPP, which is called blistered, okay? Now, both hedgehog and uh, DPP can uh, activate blistered, uh, which is expressed in the intervein region. It's a transcription factor, again, uh, and this expression of transcription factor actually uh, determines fate for cells which are present in the intervein that these cells are not going to make veins, okay? Now, the expression of, uh, where I am? expression of uh, blistered, <coughs> is actually uh, <clears throat> indirectly proportional. So here you will have hedgehog, which will, uh, why one of my slide is missing? Let me see, we have now the whole leg development, yeah. Yes, yeah, one slide is missing, but anyway, I can try to uh, explain you here. <clears throat> so what, how hedge, hedgehog and DPP are specifying this vein pattern is both hedgehog and uh, DPP, they indirectly activates the rhomboid. Rhomboid is actually a serine protease, which is part of the uh, EGFR uh, receptor signaling. And rhomboid is expressed only in the veins here. So when we are in the intervein region, rhomboid is not expressed because EGFR signaling, so signal to the EGFR by hedgehog is blocked because DPP is inhibiting uh, a hedgehog there. And in turn, uh, DPP activates uh, blistered. Um, and this blistered uh, is a transcription factor. It's uh, also, um, so if you have high expression of 
DPP, you will have high expression of, of course, blistered. Uh, and then here in the veins, you have hedgehog uh, activating EGF uh, receptor signaling, activates rhomboid and high rhomboid here, then uh, has high, uh, <clears throat> high rhomboid means uh, development of veins. So if we pay attention to this color code, so EGF signaling here, uh, I was saying EGFR, EGFI is actually receptor, EGF signaling. So activation of the uh, EGF signaling leads to high rhomboid. And then these uh, lines, they are representing EGF signal, okay? Then you have these, you know, other uh, players, which are the Iroquois, uh, which, you know, is uh, also downstream of the hedgehog. So <clears throat> in the intervene region, what we see, we have uh, control, uh, overwhelming control of DVP via blistered. And in the veins, we see EGF signaling uh, in response to hedgehog. And we see then development of these uh, veins. And in the adult wings, what we see is such veins. They are, these veins are actually uh, due to such interplay of these cell signal molecules. So let's start the leg development in uh, Prosophila. So in case of leg uh, in, in the insects, these are basically uh, simple tubes of uh, epidermis which are joined together. And uh, the epidermal cells, they secrete uh, outer cuticle exoskeleton, which looks to, which is visible in, in, in such a form. And within these tubes, we have the muscle and the nerves and the connective tissue. And if we look at the leg imaginal disc, this is how it looks like. Uh, it has an anterior compartment, posterior compartment. Then of course it has dorsal and the ventral compartments as well. If we look at the fate map of the cells within the uh, leg imaginal disc, it's very interesting because the core, the cells at the core of the imaginal disc, they make the most distal part of the uh, adult structure. And the cells at the periphery of uh, this leg imaginal disc, they make uh, the most proximal part of the leg. And the cell fate or the fate map has uh, determined the molecules of the molecular uh, players which are involved in, you know, here, for example, uh, they have gene which is called distal S, DLL. Uh, in distal S mutants, this part is not going to develop, okay? Uh, we are soon going to see the interplay of different genes which are involved in, or transcription factors which are involved in uh, such a systematic development. You can, you, you see it's a color-coded thing. So the tarsus, the most distal part is due to uh, these cells. Then the tibia is next layer of cells. Then the femur, uh, trochanter, etc. Coxa. Uh, if we look at these cells in leg imaginal disc, so this is just the top view of the, you're looking from top, uh, but if we look again from the side, uh, from the lateral view, uh, this is how the imaginal disc, the epithelial cells are organized, okay? I mean, these are color coded because we just saw some of the uh, regions. So now 
when the metamorphosis takes place and differentiation starts. So you literally pull this from center here and it's like pulling out in <clears throat> inside out uh, uh, socks, a pair of socks, okay? Just like you inside and you pull, you, you, you hold from the center, the most distal part of your socks and you bring it out. And that's how it takes place. You can see this is the uh, larval cuticle where we have these, uh, this leg imaginal disc. And now uh, the disc, it starts to evert. And this is how it looks like. Eversion, so look, you can see, and then extension takes place. You can see the it's getting uh, extended. And then eventually through the process of metamorphosis, we see uh, complete leg development uh, during pupil stage. Now, what is happening? What are the molecules? Again, we have engrailed, we have hedgehog, we have DPP, we have wingless. Initially, these are 30 cells or so at embryonic stage, I would say. And then they become 10,000 in third instar line. You have the posterior compartment, which we know is uh, high in the engrailed expression. So I think by now you should know whenever we are going to talk about posterior compartment, first thing which should blink to your mind is uh, engrailed and then hedgehog because engrailed activates hedgehog. So high hedgehog you can see uh, due to activation of hedgehog, just like wingless. So hedgehog then activates DPP, but DPP is actually restricted only within the dorsal region. On the ventral region, we have high wingless, which is responding to engrailed hedgehog interplay. And also we see uh, wingless also uh, spreading next to the DPP. Now, you can see this core. So the point where we will have DPP and wingless <coughs> signals, <coughs> signals merging, that is the proximal distal axis. That is the core from where this is going to be start everting. <coughs> now, <coughs> Let's look at the molecules which uh, are involved in this uh, leg development. So we have, uh, in case of proximal distal patterning, what happens, we have the gene called distal less, which is expressing where DPP and wingless are just uh, coming across each other. So this distal less, <clears throat> the expression of distal less uh, is also being affected by DPP and wingless uh, due to positive actions of DPP and wingless. And on the uh, distal side, the cells which are going to uh, develop distal. So this region is going to make the most distal and this blue one, the peripheral cells are going to be slowly divided into uh, the more proximal uh, cells of the leg. Now, after establishing the uh, distal less, the next gene which gets uh, active is the dark shunt. And you can see it's, these are the cells which get determined. And then eventually the homothorax which is expressed in the more cells in the most proximal uh, cells. So this is how the proximal distal patterning actually takes place uh, by establishing expression of distal less in the most distal part of the uh, 
uh, legume so the in the cells which are going to contribute to development of most distal part of the leg and then homothorax which is a homeodomain transcription factor which is established in the uh, so think of disc like this okay these rectangles are actually homothorax here and homothorax here okay so this is how uh, the patterning of leg imaginal disc takes place now uh, we also know that you know there are uh, three pairs of imaginal disc uh, we have this this one here so you can see first pair of leg is in the thoracic segment one thoracic segment two and thoracic segment three okay so it means the first pair of leg is going to develop according to the morphogens here and the second pair of leg is going to develop into t2 segment and t3 segments so and we also know that homeotic genes are involved in uh, specifying the cell fates finally and they play a crucial role in in development uh, of these uh, uh, imaginal deaths now indinapedia is the gene which is uh, expressed in para segment four and five uh, and this is the one which specifies the disc of second leg pair all this is due to the positional information you remember this french flag model uh, let's say this is the para segment four this is the para segment five etc well, they are actually due to positional information of the homeotic genes which is and the homeotic genes their expression pattern was established by expression of a long cascade of gene expression which got started from bicoid all the way to segmentation genes now if you take cells from one compartment one para segment and move them to the next para segment you know uh, you are playing with the cell fates and similarly uh, we remember the uh, legs on the head phenotype which we call the antinapedia phenotype. Antinapedia phenotype. This is due to ectopic activation of antinapedia. Normally, antinapedia is expressed in only this region where it contributes to second pair of legs. But if antinapedia gets ectopically activated, like we have moved antinapedia activation here, now this is going to contribute to leg development. So, you have to, whenever we think about uh, process of organogenesis, differentiation organogenesis, we have to look at coordinated action of cell signaling together with homeotic genes, which are basically the uh, selector genes. And then uh, we are in a better uh, position to understand uh, how differentiation takes place or organogenesis takes place. I told you also one thing that, you know, when we were talking about uh, development of wings and halters and specific segments, uh, what you should know is just like we talked the case of antinapedia, uh, that if you bring antinapedia here, you will bring legs there, okay? Uh, we said homeotic genes are involved there in their development, in development of uh, imaginal disc, their fate, and then eventually uh, the adult organs. So here, for example, in the halter disc, disc, a disc we have uh, UBX is active, which is silent uh, in wing disc. So UBX transcription factor, which is a homeotic gene, is actually active in the halter disc and that gives rise to cell fate of halter cells okay 
this this was just coming to my mind when I was I was telling you about antinatheria. So now you can design experiment. If somebody asks you to go and you know ectopically express uh, UBX in uh, wing disc or you know uh, knock down or knock out UBX in halter disc. Uh, or let's say, um, instead of such a direct experiment, if we say, okay, we uh, are going to, uh, you know, have a mutant who has lost uh, development of halt here, how are we going to monitor that? The obvious cell-based marker for halt here is UBX. And so is for the wing cells because wings, they lack, except the peripodial uh, membrane, which is just few cells there. So wingless, uh, sorry, the um, UBX is absent in the, in the wing. So you can design mm, thinking about your experiment in terms of molecules, which are involved in development of these tissues, organs uh, uh, after metamorphosis. Now, this is what the uh, last slide is. So you can see wing imaginal disc, halter imaginal disc, first pair of legs, second pair of legs, third pair of legs, the salivary glands. Uh, and these are the segments in head, segments in thorax, in abdomen. Now, these are the expression patterns of homeotic genes. Labial, the homeotic genes. Again, I would refer you to Professor Denny DeBool's talk. Uh, then the proboscipedia, uh, then deform. So all the way to antinapedia, this is antinapedia complex. Up to here. And then we see expression of homeotic uh, cluster, which is the bithorax complex. And if we pay attention, DPP is involved here, DPP is involved here, and DPP is involved here. But here it is involved through 4CAD by inhibiting 4CAD. 4CAD is being induced by sex combs reduced, so DPP is trying to counteract that. Uh, and then, you know, in salivary, the cell fate uh, is going to be uh, salivary glands. Uh, here in this region, we have. Uh, where we have the wing, we learn, you know, DPP is, you know, uh, acting on distal less, wing less is uh, positively acting on distal less, UBX, ABDA are trying to block distal less, and then you have leg development, okay? Uh, in the wing, what we have DPP activating vestigial, sex combs reduce, UBX, ABDA, they are trying to inhibit vestigial, but they are not successful in the wing. Wing will develop, but here in the halter, UBX will be active, vestigial will be silent, and then uh, we will have halter development. So this is uh, a, a beautiful, uh, this is the beauty of, learning development and you know dissecting various to, uh, using various tools which we have in fruit fly to understand how pattern formation takes place and then how one cell fates are determined how these uh, specialized cells they contribute to development of different organs uh, this was my last lecture i'll ask uh, shweb if i can uh, take uh, lecture on Thursday as well, because I want to cover the uh, development of eye uh, here. So that, uh, because this is another beautiful model where we will see cell to cell communication and you know, uh, this is to my knowledge, I mean, my, to my little knowledge, uh, this is one of the most fascinating example uh, the development of eye in fruit fly, where we see just two cells, which are um, mentioned here, eight and seven. So it's called, if 
a gene called semolus gets mutant, seventh is not missing and boss. Uh, so there is this communication going on and that if these two cells, they don't communicate properly, we have uh, completely disorganized or uh, malformed eyes. So any questions? Are there any questions? So if there are no questions, I would like to thank you all. Uh, and I'll let you know if I'm going to take next class or not. Thank you.